booming and the paycheck is big. So for people who might be, you know, looking to mint money, I mean, it, it's a great thing. I did my undergraduation from NIT Raurkela, which is basically National Institute of Technology, Raurkela. I did a B.Tech in industrial design and the course was designed in such a way that it was heavy on mechanical design, but there were also aspects of interaction design and product design there. Uh, I always knew that I wanted to move in the direction of interaction design. In fact, from my second year itself, I just knew it. So I started, you know, working in that direction, taking electives that would help me establish myself as an interaction designer later on. So once I was done with my BTEC, I started working as a UX designer for a B2B product company based out of Noida. I worked there two years and then I finally went off to pursue my master's, which was kind of always the plan. And uh, now I'm doing my MS from uh, University of Maryland College Park. I'm enrolled in this program called HCIM which is essentially an MS in human-computer interaction. I did consider other countries as well, uh, primarily UK. Uh, so there were some really good courses, there were some great universities, but uh, after doing kind of an audit, I realized that it would be better for me to focus on just one country where you know there were more courses more opportunities so for me it all came down to us after a while so the shortlisted list of universities that i had they were all based in the us there is so uh, after doing uh, let's say an ms or any kind of course in human computer interaction you would essentially land up a role as let's say a ux designer or a UX researcher, it could also be a product designer, you could be a UX engineer. So it really depends on the direction you want to go with this. So if you want to go into hardcore design, interaction design, then you know you take up a UX designer or a product designer role. If you are more of a developer and have you know imbibed these UX skills, then you go in the direction of UX engineering that has a lot of coding and code debugging to make it really accessible for people who might have disabilities. Uh, so yeah, there are many directions you can go with it and it's a field that is growing really fast all over the world. In fact, I guess among the top 10 uh, fields that might be growing in the coming years. So yeah, it has great opportunities. Just that people are kind of, people have been sleeping on it for a bit now. So they're just realizing, yeah, that UX is growing. The requirements were pretty standard. You had to submit your GRE score, your TOEFL score, uh, an SOP, of course, um, your GPA, your UG uh, mark sheet and uh, uh, so UMD also has these short essays that you have to do. There are three different prompts. Uh, so there were those. Um, but yeah, there was that. It was a lengthy application process that I remember because this was one of the longest applications that I had to fill out. The others were less in the sense that this had additional essays and this and that. So it was that and um, my GPA, uh, actually it was a CGPA, uh, my CGPA was 8.3, uh, that converted to 3.4 on a 4 point GPA scale and uh, my GRE was 332 and um, yeah it was my second attempt though so it was 332 and my TOEFL, uh, my TOEFL score was 119, I lost one mark in speaking uh, I messed up there a little, but yeah, that was that. Uh, I prepared for two months, but on the side, because I was working at that time, the good thing that happened for me, I mean, it was a boon and a bane. I won't say it, it was good as such, but that was, you know, going remote during COVID. So I had, you know, this opportunity to come back home and work from there. And, you know, once I was done, I could just shut down my laptop and start studying right away and give like two hours a day to that. So I was preparing on the side, uh, sort of dedicating about two hours every day. On weekends, maybe three. 
so that that went on and off for two months and the quant part i feel for most of us from india is easy because uh, th- that is stuff that we have studied back in school it's pretty basic uh, the verbal is you know the section that throws people off because you have to remember these words and how they are used in different contexts so for me that took a lot of preparation and then the awa section uh, analytical writing i gave it like a week just that like kind of practicing how to type out my responses what are the formats that i should follow so i made up these formats i memorized them and i was like okay if the prompt comes up these are the sections that you know how i structure my essay and just belt it out so i feel awa is a section where a lot of people even when they have a good gre score they don't have a good awa score and that really matters so that is a section people should just dedicate a lot of time to i started in uh, my term started in 2021 august <laughs> september end was when i gave my gre so the first thing i did in the application process was get done with my test So GRE I gave it towards the end of September and I started preparing for it in July. And once I was done with my GRE I gave myself a time frame of 1 month to get done with the TOEFL. I think I really delayed my SOP but people should not do that. I started towards the end of December and I ended up missing one deadline because of it because it was on January 1st and I could not, you know, be done with my SOP in time. So I would totally not suggest it just get to it like right from the start. Just start working on your SOP, go slow but you know steadily at least you're making your progress there. The second one was January 15th which was University of Maryland, University of Michigan Ann Arbor and University of Washington Seattle. So all three on January 15th. So I submitted all the three on the night like the night before. So uh I applied to Carnegie Mellon I applied to a uh, University of Maryland, University of Michigan, uh, Georgia Tech, University of Washington Seattle and RIT. I got into CMU, uh, University of Maryland College Park, uh, University of Michigan Ann Arbor and RIT. I got rejected by Georgia Tech and University of Washington Seattle, which was quite a shock because I thought that Georgia Tech was kind of a deal for me, like seal deal for me. But that happened and then this is these are, you know, tough times. in the sense that even if you have a very strong profile and everything you just don't know because a lot of people from the past year have deferred admission and you just don't know what's going to happen so just like apply to like 6 to 9 universities i would say i wasn't really sure in which direction i wanted to go with You know once I, I was done with this uh, I did not know if I wanted to pursue research or if I wanted to go straight into the industry again so I wanted to keep those options open now CMU HCI is a one year program it's very industry driven like right you know right from the start i guess 3 months into the course you are paired up with an industry partner and you start working on your capstone project So it's not a lot of teaching it's just a lot of experiential learning there. And with the University of Maryland it was a two year course and in the second year you have the choice to decide the track that you want to take whether you want to go for a capstone project or a thesis. So I felt that it was you know it just had both the options and I just didn't have to pick right from the start that yeah I want to do research or I want to go into the industry so that seemed really illustrious to me and University of Michigan the only reason that that was you know for me I just knew I didn't want to go there was the class size is really huge 90 people and I just wanted it to be a smaller cohort than that because you know then you get to interact with everyone sort of work with everyone and it's not that competitive within the course so it was that for me around the university so college park is a very quaint town uh it, it's a student town basically so the weekends are 
like you will find students walking around and all the you know happening places are right around the campus and they're in a small area so you'll find a lot of crowd there it's really happening over the weekends and uh, like it's a huge university so a lot of students are out there the campus itself is huge and beautiful like it's just beautiful so uh, even around the campus you know people just go around walk around even on normal days between classes and you have like a lot of cafes on the campus as well and yeah so people just do that so that is <laughs> it for us So the winter semester, a lot of people take courses over the winter semester as well, like this vacation period that we have. Those are happening online, so we got a not notification for it in December itself. And we are expecting that the first few weeks of the spring semester are going to be online, but then we might move to an offline uh, class system again. Uh, and the whole of first semester was offline. The job markets, to be honest, are not very badly affected, but the internship opportunities were. Last year, at least, like the people before us, uh, they've had a problem securing internship opportunities because well, uh, a lot of you know companies were uh, the, the smaller startups. They don't usually hire Indians or anyone on F1 visa because they are looking for people that they may want to hire full time later on. It's really important to not just focus on the rankings, but also where you want to go with the course because rankings mean nothing after a while. People with you know degrees from colleges that are not very highly ranked are also doing extremely well here. So it's really about what you make out of the course rather than how well the course is ranked. Mm -hmm.